the indicators are related to the Millennium Development Goals. Eight of the ten are electricity and flooring is not, but as I signaled, they are differently defined. So to signal up front, one of the challenges of this exercise are data constraints. And so just to highlight them, um, because they affect uh, the results, uh, data for some indicators are missing. Um, and the missing values in some surveys have led to sample size reductions. We've done bias analysis where the sample sizes are less than 87%. Respondents vary across the different countries and surveys. And individual level data is, is, is very sparse. Um, which means that we cannot disaggregate by gender, by age, by many variables that we would wish to. Um, the surveys are updated, but ir not every year, every three to five years, and they come from different year sources. And they exclude certain populations. For example, women are interviewed in DHS up to the age of 49, but not over that age. Or as all household surveys, certain institutional populations are excluded. And a very common question, why do we not include income or consumption? And as I think most of you would know, the surveys that we have unfortunately do not have that uh, data, except for the WHS, which has a very abbreviated and probably not very accurate um, module. So in a sense, one of the strong calls that we share, I think, in doing this exercise is the call to improve data gathering and, and its quality. Um, Mrs. Bergignon, Stefan Klassen, Ravi Kanbar, uh, a, a lot of people. But, but we just echo the call of many others that the need for better data will, um, is particularly acute when you require all of the indicators from the same survey. The other th um, examples is that for 62 countries, we have all of the 10 indicators. For 93, we have nine of the 10. For 101, we have eight of the 10, and then for three, we lack three indicators, Latvia, Myanmar, and Suriname. And then for 15 countries, the biases um, from the sample su size reduction mean that we can interpret our results as lower or upper bounds only. And unfortunately, this includes China, South Africa, Pakistan, um, countries that we would really wish to have quite um, good measures for. And in the case of Brazil, we are missing two indicators. So there are um, some constraints on the results that we will present um, at this point. In terms of weights, we've weighted each dimension equally. Um, this is following, in a sense, the HDI and the HPI in terms of the tradition. But the weights were very much debated in the 1990s when those indicators were released. So Chaudhry and Squire, for example, um, did a paper looking at expert weights. Um, Foster, McGillivray, and Seth have done robustness tests on the HDI and found that varying the weights between a half to a quarter on any one of the indicators results in 92% of the country rankings being robust. So there, there is now a secondary literature on those weights, which we are trying <coughs> to uh, buy into, in some sense, to justify the equal weighting among the three dimensions. And we also were following Tony Atkinson's suggestion James mentioned, which is that um, this is in his work uh, for the European uh, harmonized data, that the interpretation of a set of indicators is greatly eased where the individual components have degrees of importance that while not necessarily exactly equal, are not grossly different. And so there is certainly an ease in explanation to policy for policy purposes when the weights are equal. Um, Within each dimension, we take what James called the nested weight. So we, at this point, have equal weights between each indicator within the dimension. And because we have two in health and education, that means one-sixth is the weight on those four indicators. And we have six for standard of living, so one-eighteenth is the weight on each of those six indicators. Now, in terms of the justification for these, um, and as um, James mentioned, Mariana had convened a workshop and has a good forthcoming paper in econometric reviews um, on weights and multidimensional measures. And there are different frameworks for setting weights. There are different procedures using survey data, using statistical techniques, using normative, using expert opinion, using participatory discussions. And all of these have actually been implemented by different uh, countries at different times. Um, and so there would be certainly scope for experimenting with the other approaches to setting weights. Um, 
but this is what we have done as very much a first count. And as Mariema will present, we've done some very preliminary robustness uh, tests just for one country, and we'll be constructing others for, um, for this set. Um, the methodology James has presented, um, so we simply use the M0, the adjusted head count measure of our class of measures. And what the MPI does is clearly it, it answers the questions that James put forward. It specifies dimensions, indicators, cutoffs, um, weights, and the value of K, the poverty cutoff. Um, so what I would like to go through now is particularly the identification step. So in describing the indicators, we generated the G0 matrix. Um, for every person, we have the number of those 10 indicators in which they are deprived. And so our question now is which of those people are multidimensionally poor? Um, I was in Nepal uh, late last week, and what they were singing the benefits of open toilets, that that is a very you know, desirable form. And so if you have that as one of your deprivations, you might not consider it a deprivation. Or you might have a low body mass index because you're a fashion model. Or you might like to cook with wood and have a separate chimney. So having one deprivation does not necessarily indicate multidimensional poverty. Furthermore, um, there are data issues. Uh, data can be inaccurate. Um, and so identification, in a sense, serves two purposes. One is to allow some scope for personal choice, um, for difficulties in comparability across countries. Uzbekistan has very, very high, um, was it cooking fuel, I think? Yeah. Um, so some countries have, have particular configurations um, and, and to correct for inaccuracies. So we identify any person as deprived if the weighted sum, having applied these, these weights that I mentioned of one-sixth on each of the uh, health and education indicators and one-eighteenth on the standard of living, if the weighted sum of their deprivations, that C column vector James pointed out, equals 30%, 3 out of 10. What this means in practice is that uh, a person has to be deprived in any two of the health and education indicators, in all six of the standard of living indicators, or in one health and education and any three of the standard of living indicators in order to be identified as multidimensionally poor. And if they are not, then, as James said, goodbye. Their deprivations are censored from the matrix, and they are considered non-poor. Empirically, this makes a difference. Um, in Gabon, for example, the range, uh, the difference between the number of people who were deprived in sanitation and those who were multidimensionally poor was quite high. Um, so it was 53% in that, up to 78% uh, was the difference between the total head counts in any of the 10 indicators and the censored head counts. So, India had a slightly less range child enrollment. In India, 96% of the children, uh, people having children out of school were, were considered multidimensionally poor. Um, but it's just to say, so in identification, we are requiring a minimum of 30%, and we are censoring, yeah? Um, it's, we calculated the MPI for all uh, 10 percentile cutoffs, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to 10. And we looked, because this was an international exercise, so it's not a country where you're going to have a lot of discussion, uh, we looked for a good range among the 104 countries um, in the MPI values, and we looked at what seemed um, to be reasonable in terms of, of the distribution. Uh, and so that's how we set it, and we'll show robustness tests at the end. Um, I've gone in the wrong direction. So having now censored, we have the G0K matrix, we've censored all of the people who are deprived but not multidimensionally poor, and then the aggregation is very simple. It's the percentage of people who are multidimensionally deprived, multidimensionally poor, times the average what we call intensity which is the average percentage of weighted percentage of dimensions, percentage of weighted indicators in which the average person in that country is deprived. 
So H we're calling incidence, and A we're calling intensity, uh, learning from Mexico's vocabulary on that. So just if you like the matrix, here it is with the weights. <laughs> um, 10 indicators with their weights specified, just as an example of, of how that would look. We also wanted to clearly look and see if the statistical results had validity in communities. And so did, as these things are, um, a few anecdotal and non-representative, but very important for us qualitative studies in different countries, just looking at people who were MPI poor, looking at how they were judged in terms of national poverty measures, um, and learning importantly from the colleagues who were doing these studies uh, how to improve MPI. So this is Tabitha in the Lunga Lunga slum in Nairobi. Um, she is income poor. Um, she's a washer person, earns 66 cents for a wash, and when she does not have work, then she would go and find the materials that she can find, which are cloth, and take them home and dethread them and sell the thread for between 13 to 65 cents, depending on the number of kilos she can produce in a day. So here's a person who's income poor, and our question is what more can MPI say about her life? We found one of her six children is malnourished. She needs to buy and carry her water. She has to pay to use a toilet. They do not have electricity or the assets. So in terms of the MPI, um, she, as, as all of the individuals, then has, in a sense, an intensity of poverty. Her intensity was 39%, um, so less than the average intensity of Kenya, which is 50%, um, and we can specify what those deprivations are. We did such studies, as I said, in, in other areas and learned a great deal from these people. <coughs> so I will go rather quickly through the results because I think that maybe these have been um, seen and they're a, a first cut. Uh, we also have a, a copy of research briefs if people are interested. So it covers 104 countries that 78 0.5% of the world's population are 5.2 billion people. There is some regional distribution. Um, our coverage is 94% of the population in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. The least well-covered region is the Arab states where we only cover 60% of the population. Mm, these are UN regions. Um, we're taking the population figures all from 2007, although our surveys come from different years, just for purposes of presentation. So of those 5.2 billion people at, at, a, at a global level, 32%, 1.6 uh, million are multidimensionally poor. And that number at a global level uh, uh, for the countries for which we have both income poverty data and the MPI um, is between $1.25 and $2 a day. Um, so this is a, a visual graphic of the head counts. So not the MPI, but the head count of people who are multidimensionally poor in each country ranging from zero to 93%, and then the respective income headcount for those countries. Yes? Right. We simply reported the year in the tables from which we are drawing the survey. We did not try to extrapolate or to update them to harmonize them at all. So um, there has been from 2000 to 2008. Um, so what we see here is that there is clearly a relationship between income poverty, which is indicated in black, and the MPI, which is the colored bar, where the colors represent the three dimensions and their contribution to MPI, but that the relationship is not perfect. Um, and so some, it's not a uniform $1.50 a day measure, that there is some noise, and we need to do more research, country studies, regional studies, and explore more how these relate and and how they complement each other. Um, in terms of that 1.66 million people, 1.6 billion people who are multidimensionally poor, 51% of them live in South Asia and 28% in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the increment from the world, from the population figures for those countries uh, of the poor people is, is quite high, whereas East Asia and the other regions have relatively uh, less empty.